The second Sunday of Easter is also known as Divine Mercy Sunday because on this day we encounter a Jesus who gifts his disciples the one gift that they will require in order to be missionaries after his own heart. It is in his mercy and in his unconditional love that Jesus appears to the disciples. The gospel text is from the gospel of John chapter 20 verses 19 to 31 and contains two appearances of the post-resurrected Jesus. The first appearance is to the disciples when Thomas is not present and the second is when Thomas is present. In the first, the disciples are afraid and the closed doors are a sign that they are afraid. Their leader has been crucified. Their leader has been laid in the tomb. The Lord whom they believed in is no more. They are leaderless. They are headless. They are without direction. And the only response the disciples can think of is to hide away. It is even as they are assembled behind closed doors that the Lord appears to them. And even as the Lord appears to them because closed doors are no hindrance to the risen Jesus, he gifts them the gift of peace. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And this word shalom is a word which concerns wholeness. Peace not only in the economic sense, peace not only in the spiritual sense, peace not only in the emotional sense, but peace in every single area of a person's life. So the word peace might be translated wholeness. And that is a gift, not a wish from the Lord. The Lord gives this peace to his disciples. And the disciples encounter the Lord and their hearts are filled with joy. And the Lord gives them this peace again, a second time, to reinforce that he is the giver of gifts. Even as he gives them this peace, he gives them also a commission. And the commission is to continue the work of love, to continue the work of the kingdom that he himself inaugurated because his words are, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. The Lord was convinced that he was indeed sent by the Father. And the Lord is convinced that it is he who sends now the disciples. And then he gives them a more tangible gift when he breathes on them and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. The verb which John uses to indicate breathing is the Greek verb emphusao. This verb is used only one other time in the scriptures and that is in Genesis, in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, when God breathes life into the first human being. So when God breathes life into Adam, it is emphusao. When Jesus breathes the Spirit into the disciples, it is emphusao. By using this same verb, John is saying that as God breathed life into the first human beings, so Jesus is breathing 
new life into his disciples when he gives them once again the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then the commission is explained. What exactly does this commission mean? And the commission is that the disciples are called to forgive and to retain sin. What does this mean in practice? In practice, this means that like Jesus, because the mission is the mission of Jesus, like Jesus was a mirror before people, so the disciples must be mirrors before people, that people will look at the disciples and ask about them. Who are you? That you do these things and that you do them in this way. The first concerns the identity. Who are you? When Pilate encountered Jesus in the Gospel of John, and when Jesus responded to all the allegations that were being made against him, to all the charges that were being made against him with equanimity, Pilate wondered and asked Jesus, where are you from? He was not asking at that time for the address of Jesus. He was not asking for the residence of Jesus. When he asked Jesus, where are you from? He was asking where Jesus drew his strength from. Now, when people ask about the disciples, who are you? They are asking about where the disciples get their identity from. And the disciples very clearly get their identity from the risen Christ because it is the risen Christ who sends them just as the Jesus was sent by the Father. That you do these things. The Christian, the disciple of Jesus, does things which everyone else would reject, which they do not want to do, which they will push away, which they will close their eyes to, which they will close their ears to. Over the years, we have seen, whether in our own country, India, or all over the world, the church has been at the forefront of doing things which others will not want. Whether it is looking after orphan children, whether it is reaching out to battered women, whether it is reaching out to refugees and migrants and people in need, whether it is reaching out in war-torn situations. Everywhere, the church has been at the forefront and must be at the forefront. That you do these things and that you do them in this way, the way in which a disciple responds to a situation must be markedly different from the way in which anyone else would respond. It has to have a special quality. It has to have the mark of Jesus. It has to have the symbol of Jesus. It has to be just like the Lord would have done. That you do them in this way. So whether it is in the field of education, whether it is in the field of social work, whether it is in the field of being an individual disciple in my neighborhood, in my home, I have to be markedly different so that people recognize me not by the dress I wear, not by the language I speak, not by the food I eat, but they recognize me by the person I am. That you do them in this way. The first Christian community, the first reading from the Acts of the Apostles will tell us were of one mind and one heart. And they came together. And when they came together, there was only one reality among them. And it was the reality of love, the love which Jesus had poured into their hearts. The love which enabled them then to share whatever they had with others. That no one called anything his or her own. They shared 
whatever they had. They were a community. Even though they were individuals separately, when they came together, they were a community of believers who believed in the Lord and showed that faith in action. This is the faith which Peter talks about in his letter to those who claim to be disciples of Jesus. He says that their faith will be tested as gold is tested in fire. And as gold overcomes this test of fire, so must the faith of the disciples overcome any test that it might come against, any test that might pose itself. And the disciples are happy when they receive the Spirit, when they receive the gift of the Lord, when they receive His commission to be that mirror. The second part of the text speaks about the appearance of Jesus to Thomas. And even though many use a misnomer for Thomas when they call Thomas doubting Thomas. The Lord and John the Evangelist never use the word doubting. The Greek word dupsikos, which is translated in English as doubting, means a person who is double-minded. Thomas is not double-minded and that is why the Lord does not call Thomas dupsikos. The Lord calls Thomas Apistos. And Apistos means unbelieving. So the Lord says to Thomas, do not be Apistos, be Pistos. Do not be unbelieving, but be believing. The word doubt is never used. But the point is this, that the Lord has appeared to the disciples when Thomas is not present. And the disciples have been given the spirit they have been gifted with the peace of the Lord and they have been given a fantastic commission just as the Lord's commission was when he was given it by the Father. And they narrate this to Thomas. They tell Thomas this. And Thomas looks at the disciples. And Thomas notices that there is no change whatever in them. There is no change in the external of the disciples, there is no change in their hearts. There is no change as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. And Thomas says, you are saying to me that the Lord has appeared to you. You are saying to me the Lord has breathed on you. You are saying to me the Lord has given you a commission. I can't see it in your externals. I can't see it in your lives. And therefore, I cannot believe. And the Lord possibly realizes that the disciples will not be able to convince Thomas. And so the Lord comes a second time. And this time, Thomas is present. And even as the Lord appears, he invites Thomas to come and put his finger in the side, in the marks of the nails. But Thomas does not want that kind of proof. Thomas is only unbelieving and he becomes believing immediately when he acclaims Jesus with the highest acclamation found anywhere in the New Testament because the acclamation of Thomas is my Lord and my God. Thomas believed because the Lord appeared to him. But Thomas could not believe when the disciples narrated their experience to him because the disciples were not as convincing as they ought to have been. And the Lord pronounces a beatitude when he says, You believe because you have seen. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And many of us think that the Lord is referring to us because we have not seen and that is not true. You and I who profess to be disciples of Jesus, you and I who profess to be baptized are privileged 
not only to see the Lord, but to receive him whenever we go for the sacrament of the Eucharist. So the Lord is not talking about us when he pronounces that beatitude because we are already blessed. We see the Lord in the Eucharist. We receive the Lord in the Eucharist. The Lord comes to us in the Eucharist, in the innermost depths of our being. The Lord is referring to the millions of people who have never really known him and yet believe in love. Who have never really encountered him but yet reach out in love. Who have never really known what the Lord and who the Lord is and yet keep striving for truth, for justice and for peace. As in the Acts of the Apostles, the reason why the community was called Christians was because it was seen very clearly that they were disciples of Christ by their actions. Today, 2,000 years later, each one of us is called to the same action which the first disciples, the first Christians performed. That is, actions of love, striving for justice, striving for peace, and being that mirror in front of everyone we meet who has never had the privilege of meeting Jesus, they must say about us when they encounter us, Who are you that you do these things and that you do them in this way?